And welcome back, everybody, to the 15th annual MIT CEO IQ Symposium. We're now at session 11A. So if your travel plans don't involve a connection through 11A, then you're probably on the wrong aircraft. Uh, this talk is going to be very interesting. Uh, tips from the trenches. So what we have is a um, chief data officer who has been placed into a legacy environment and asked specifically to transform that business into a new digital business. So this is going to be a terrific session on this. Please do, as you have been, continue to submit your questions and answers uh, in the chat function in the Wahoba uh, platform, and we will get to some Q&A at the end of it. But for now, I'm going to welcome Sonia Crosby and Susan Wilson. Sonia is from Westpac, New Zealand. She is the uh, person who did the work, and Susan Wilson is her colleague at Informatica, who has, I believe, been partnering with her on these initiatives. Uh, ladies, over to you. Hi, and welcome. My name is Susan Wilson. I'm the Vice President of the Data Governance and Privacy segment with Informatica. I'm excited to be your host today for today's session um, regarding tips from the trenches going from zero to hero. Today I have with us Sonia Crosby, the Chief Data Officer for Westpac New Zealand, to tell her story. In fact, Sonia, why don't we go ahead and have you introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Susan, for the intro. Um, tips from the trenches, gosh, it sounds like it's a war out there, and um, it certainly is in lots of different ways. Um, I am in a new role with Westpac, just coming up for my first year as Chief Data Officer, but my background is less so in banking and more about innovation and business growth. Um, so this is a transformation role that I have come into um, based on the realisation that um, data sits behind every disruption. And when you're in a disrupted environment, um, we really need to get this right. And we really need to invest and think about how we use our data for best effect for our customers and for our business. So um, the board and executive have actually brought this role together, um, thinking about it as a key foundation piece. Um, and when we think about banking, we've got sort of, we've got a few things in play. One is we've got a very heavily regulated environment. Um, we also have um, the recognition that data is a key uh, value creator for digital, because what is digital but data? Um, and also, um, when we're thinking about um, businesses that have been in business for a really long time that are quite well established, so Westpac New Zealand has been running for over 160 years, over that time you have intergenerational legacy, um, so system on system on system, um, and that can have the, the pleasure of lots and lots of data, but the pain of trying to bring it together in a sensible way. Um, so there were a few things externally driving this decision as well to stand this area up. Um, one is, you know, obviously our customer expectations have changed. We know that it's it's table stakes now to both um, be thinking about personalised events and communication and activities, and and you know your customer expects you to know them. Um, secondly, um, you know our competitors are out there, and uh, machine learning is really table stakes. If you're not in this place, then you're going to be running behind, and laggards um, don't actually fare very well, as we've seen with the Kodaks of the world. Um, commoditization of technology, I think it's an exciting time because as the speed of technology has improved, things are possible that weren't possible a few years ago. So the art of the possible is really what we want to make it. So we, we can't say that technology is in our way, it's actually there for us to use. Um, and then there's the risk of not doing. You know, um, we've seen a number of producers peaked and fell um, through not actually investing in this space early enough or enough. Um, and we really don't want to be in that space where we're disrupted. So, and the, the last part, which I think is really, really important, is if you think about just about every disruption in the last five years, it has been based on data. Um, so if you really want to be a disruptor or disrupt yourself, you need to start with the data. So it's a pretty exciting time, exciting role, and I'm, ex I'm excited to be sharing my story. Excellent, we're excited for you to do that, absolutely. Um, you know, Building data as a value creator for digital transformation is top of mind for many of our CDOs listening in on today's um, call. Can you share how you look at the value chain of data? 
Yeah, and I think it all starts from what's the business value and where's the ROI? And I don't think we connect these things enough. Often our data is sort of buried out the back and it's used a lot, but it's not necessarily connected straight through to that business line. Um, we know that there's a bottom line, and this is McKinsey numbers, um, that the value at stake is an order of 20% of EBIT or about 2 to 5% of revenue. Um, for most banks. So it's a pretty compelling story on the bottom line, but you need to be able to connect those things together directly to the work. Um, and, you know, we look at things, in addition to that revenue line, we look at things like uh, risk reduction and um, effectiveness or productivity and capacity improvements. So with that value chain, it's not just, can, you know, understanding what that business value is, but thinking about what data is directly aligned to that in order to create that value and how we can continuously improve it. So this is not something that's a one and done, it's a continuous fluid um, thinking approach. And um, we also need to think then how we extract that insight to inform decisions. Um, and that it's again, not once and done, but we're actively having that data in that decision mode constantly and surfacing that information, that insight to our people so that they can actually use it. It's at their fingertips when they need it. Um, and then lastly, making sure that not only is it at their fingertips, but it's embraced, it's believed, it's got the gravitas um, and it's usable for that purpose, but for that purpose. I loved how you connected the dots, right, from the business value all the way down into the people and the processes to the data, made it meaningful from a digital transformation perspective. You know, I speak to many chief data officers, and that's oftentimes their pain point um, because, you know, when they see digital transformation, it's more system oriented, and they're forgetting all of the parts around data, the business, the processes, the people, and really connecting it. So there's a great overview in terms of how you're pulling that all together. In fact, let's double click on that a bit more. Now that you've shared a bit more, you know, of your top level board expectations, your vision, the connection, can you give us a peek into what's it like in the trenches and your starting point of maturity? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, um, analytics, you know, we've already established it's, it's critical uh, top of mind activity for companies and um, it is hard in the trenches, right? So while, you know, again, another McKinsey stat, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about our engagement with McKinsey shortly, but, you know, 44% of businesses recognise the disruption of data and analytics. But it's really hard. Only 17% have been able to define an analytics roadmap and uh, achieve a sustainable competitive advantage through its use because it is quite complex. There is a lot to it. And when we think about, um, you know, in the trenches, the, the challenges that we're facing, one of the first things, I, when I joined at the end of August last year, I was asked to um, explain to the board what does great look like um, and how do we stack up against great? Um, and what are the gaps and how do we then propose to close those gaps? And so um, we had a, a relationship already established and I um, spoke with McKinsey's Quantum Black, that's the advanced analytics arm. And we put in place a benchmark which allowed us to understand kind of what, are, what is best practice um, globally. Uh, we assessed ourselves against 175 similar sized financial organisations globally. Um, and we were assessed against seven key elements and underneath that there are 35 key characteristics. Um, so from that we were able to establish kind of where were we kind of okay and where were we way behind and therefore what were the things that we really needed to focus in on and we could prioritise. And that then gave me the two things, it gave me the gravitas but also um, the the real crunchy gap analysis um, and then you know once you know what you're problem is you can solve it, right? So some of the times it's actually what are these things? And so if I think about those seven key areas, um, it starts from the top with strategy. Are we actually aligning to our, um, our data and analytics, which I talked about before? I keep coming back to this because it's really, really important. Um, do we have ca the right capability? Have we got the right delivery methodology? Um, are we using modern technology or are we using crusty old tools from, you know, centuries ago? Um, and um, you know, do we have the right data management? Are we treating our data right? Do we have the right governance in place? And most importantly, um, are we adopting and understanding and using it well and then scaling it out for uh, repeat 
opportunities rather than one-off, 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 yeah? So um, when we sort of think about those things, it's about, you know, do you have a bold long-term vision um, linked into business strategy or do you have your own strategy? It has to be linked. Um, and are the executive aligned with that? Um, do we have prioritised domains and a healthy data ecosystem in place? Do we have the right platform partnerships and, and good economics connecting our effort to value? Um, our organisation and talent, um, what we found was a whole lot of gaps, um, having the right talent strategy and the right structure and roles. So a lot of talent, but not necessarily in the right roles or enabled in the right way to be successful. Um, and then uh, a, an overarching framework for governance and data quality, because if at the end of the day, if your quality is not right, um, then you're working with rubbish. So <laughs> you get what you, you, know, you get what you put in, um, uh, out. Um, key capabilities, you know, um, just some examples. Uh, we have lots of analysts, but not necessarily that translation role between business and technology. Um, machine learning, really key. Um, the engagement and link with software um, design and human-centred design uh, and the value chains. Uh, where is data in that conversation? If it's all qual and no data, then uh, we're missing a trick. And um, the modelling and then really, really importantly, the data storytelling. How do we visualise and bring it to life in a way that makes it usable? Um, our agile delivery has actually been pretty good. We started our agile journey about three, four years ago. Um, so it was really more about bringing data into the conversation in a different way rather than help me validate my idea so that I can get on with it to actually being at the front or front and centre of actually which avenue should we be exploring, where are our opportunities or what are the, um, you know, those pieces of business value that we're going after help us to actually determine that and um, then help us be objective along the way, help us activate it really well and then help us understand and measure it as it's going. Um, the right tools are really, really important, um, and that's also a part of how we attract the right talent. So if we're not investing in the workbench, um, then we're not going to attract um, those great people. Um, and then, you know, again, change management, impact measurement, workflow management for our demand capacity, those are all sort of fundamentals that weren't here. So our key um, areas of focus have been on um, getting our data infrastructure sorted, um, so, you know, working with that intergenerational legacy on legacy, um, data gets trapped in systems and it gets really difficult to integrate. So um, we have worked on bringing through a steel thread to bring it to life. So what I mean by that is um, instead of trying to solve all problems at once, pick one user case that really matters, that has huge value for the business and run that end to end so that we are standing up the right data in a good um, environment, whether that be on-prem or in cloud, we're obviously migrating to cloud, um, bring through all of the um, security, um, the design, the user design, our customer experience, our business end, all of that together working as one end-to-end -end squad um, so that we're actually seeing it in action from end-to-end -end and working together on it. And I'll tell you that um, that has really changed um, our world in terms of breaking silos bringing fragmented yeah. um, business units together um, and actually thinking about an outcome-based approach. Um, our overall maturity is quite, um, I would say that we're, we're not beginners, but we're also not running. So we're probably at crawling to walking pace in terms of where we are on the, on the um, continuum. And so a lot of that's to do with um, embedding understanding um, and capability across our organisation. And so while we had, we had a good centre of excellence, it was quite small, but also it was a hub and spoke. So um, what you're not doing if you, if you focus on a hub and spoke is um, lifting overall capability. So it's really, really important to go out and into the business and lift that capability there so that everyone understands. Um, otherwise, you know, you're, you've got um, a lack of coordination, lack of understanding, and people don't actually know what questions to ask of their data. Um, add to this um, a lot of fragmentation and silos, people with really good intent and really strong delivery culture, um, but everyone, you imagine everyone running in their own lane and a bit like fireworks heading off in different directions rather than coming together. So um, that then causes duplication of effort and a lack of the ability to have repeat patterns in play so that you can go faster with other opportunities too. Yeah, there's a lot in there. I just I loved how you described the framework. 
um, you know, to me, this is this is very much a change management exercise. You know, you talked about, um, you know, the culture, leadership, the people, the processes, the technology, all part of a change change management framework. And we're at various stages. You're at a crawl to getting ready to run. Um, so there, 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 there are those points. And not everybody's going to be at the same place. This is very much working with your business functions and helping them along and building in, you know, the data skills, like the data language um, that's needed. In fact, most CDOs that are listening right now are saying, gosh, Sonia sounds a lot like me. You know, there's a lot there. There's a lot there or where she started from and where she's going to, you know, the change management exercise is very much resonating with them. So can you share how you are maturing your program from zero to here? Because it, it really is about change. You're advocating for this new way of working. And so um, I'd love to hear it and I know that our audience would as well. Yeah, so, you know, we, we are, we're on this, on this journey from capturing value um, and having, um, you know, to having data as part of our DNA and the way that we think and do. Um, and, and there's real belief that's needed um, with that, that it is actually what is going to help us create a sustainable competitive advantage. Um, so, and we want to be a disruptor in our own industry. So you get people excited about that. Um, and demonstrate through doing, through choosing those um, slim use cases and running with them. Um, you know, we did, we're not exactly a standing start, so we have had really strong executive support, um, good talent in-house, albeit siloed, um, good agile teams, um, a data governance framework, albeit not operationalised, um, not effectively, um, and, you know, good progressive technology strategy, um, but um, in some, you know, we're, we're pretty good in terms of machine learning through AI in our fin crime and AML activities, um, as are most banks. Um, however, how do you actually take that across the business as well and advance and, and, you know, bring through more of the advanced thinking and the way of doing. But more importantly, I think what we have to work with here is a great deal of passion um, and ambition, and you can do a lot with that attitude. Um, so to get us from sort of crawling, walking to running, um, the things that we did is, is firstly um, have absolutely linked down data vision to the overarching business strategy. Everything we do in terms of our planning, we do quarterly planning, um, which has then sprints in between, so we run an agile approach, um, is linked to our effort to value is absolutely connected. So we can tell now with our um, using data, we can tell exactly who's working on what and how that connects to the bigger picture. Um, and I think that's really, really important. Um, we have clearly established two big, um, two big sort of call outs in terms of goals. So apart from the business strategy, our own approach is to lift our data quality. Um, and we have some pretty ambitious um, targets on that um, and to lift our data maturity. And so we have some pretty ambitious targets on that. And we also have submetrics across those seven elements that I talked about earlier. And we've connected the levers in the gap areas into um, those metrics. So we know which levers, and we're running um, small test and learns to see which levers we pull are actually going to um, hit that data maturity and take it forward. Um, so we are actually using the science to actually help us design our program. Um, the other thing we did um, is um, working with the business to determine that backlog. Um, so a lot of co-design, I mean, we didn't just use an outsource to assess a benchmark. I would have uh, run probably about 20 um, workshops and co-design sessions with over 100 of our key staff and stakeholders across the business for us to actually un understand and unpack where they are today. Because you can you can put a stake in the ground, but if you don't know, and if you don't start from the journey from where our stakeholders are, um, then you're, you may be starting at a different point. So really important for us to work together on that, to establish that backlog and those needs together, um, and then prioritise together. Um, Within that, I was actually able to build some champions because when you see um, people come together in co-design, the champions really stand out. They're the ones that we've really got them behind because they actually help us through that demonstration through doing. 
um, and help us bring to life and have the buy-in that we needed to be able to get going. The other thing we've done is we've pulled through um, coaching for our executive because you know how I said it starts at the top and, and we need to link to vision. Well, if the executive and board around the table don't understand a new starter themselves, it's really hard for them to get engaged. And while they want to, um, you know, our CEO said to me, Sonia, we want to be role models, but actually we don't know what that means. Can you help us? Um, so I have a data coach working alongside each um, executive member to create a data magic moment for them. Um, that's about bringing data to life for them from a business point of view. Um, so that they can then understand um, and are, are getting some of the benefit for it directly for themselves in terms of the sorts of things they want to see. That then necessarily means that you need to work with the next couple of layers down because the moment they see something and they question it, their direct reports need to know how to answer that question. So um, it started a whole new ball game, but what's really great about that is it's really super connected to the things that matter most um, and is really driving that engagement with them and making them um, champions. They also front all of my events. So I, I take turns uh, giving executive the opportunity to introduce data activities, um, which also brings them in. Um, that transparency is another big thing. Um, I present um, directly to board on how we're going, um, where we're stumbling, uh, because it's not easy. And you don't want to be just showing up saying, yes, we're on track, um, when actually it's quite, you know, you're not actually showing the journey. I think it's really important to be transparent about the things that are simple, the things that are not simple. One of the areas in particular that we focus in on is what is our most important data called the critical data elements. One of those could have many hundred controls and many thousand data points underneath it. So um, on a simple piece of paper, it might look like one critical data element. Well, why don't you have them all sorted without understanding the complexity that lies beneath it? So I think um, helping people understand is really important. Um, building those relationships with every domain is super important um, and um, ac actively engaging um, with those domains and understanding their need states, super important. Um, helping our people know where to get help. So um, one of the biggest things I've done is reset our operating model. Um, where we were when I joined, we had a whole lot of analysts distributed throughout the business uh, with no support, all of them being treated as if they're unicorns when in actual fact, you know, they're, they're, they're varying degrees of uh, capability and talent from different backgrounds and experience levels. They need support and also, you know, you need a range of capability to be able to deliver. So where uh, an analyst needs support is often in the modelling and what we found was analysts trying to do their own pipelining. You see a lot of repeat work, you see a lot of mistakes, not a lot of QA or peer review or support and coaching happening. Um, so um, that was a big one. Creating a common language for data and um, establishing a definition of ready with our business as well was a big one because we get a lot of requests and but um, often they're not well formed um, and they're not connected to the business outcome. And so giving the uh, permission, but also helping the business understand how to engage, what does definition of ready look like? So that when you do get started, you really do get started. And um, that was super important. I think um, the biggest thing going back to the operating model is um, creating a strong center of gravity for that di distributed analytical support. I didn't want to pull it into a hub and spoke because I think it's really important that we have that capability in the business and that we're lifting the overall organization. So instead of pulling those analysts in, what we've done is put a framework of support around them. Um, bringing scarce resources into the center and uh, but pushing them back out in a flow to work where they're needed most. So data science, complex solutioning, engineering support, things like that. Um, are managed centrally, but distributed alongside analysts and business in the workflow. That also allows us to see the repeat pattern opportunities. Um, we have a set up automation squad, which is all about live streaming fast, um, fast data into the hands of decision makers. Um, and again, they're central um, in terms of their backlog, but they're distributed in terms of where they work. So they work alongside the analysts, removing that um, duplicated heavy manual effort work. Um, I've introduced the uh, change management with data literacy 
agency. We run a whole lot of Inspire events, um, everything from how did New Zealand use data to win the America's Cup, um, to how some of our social organisations have democratised data for community good, um, to currently we're doing the Amazon Deep Racer uh, event, which we've got some 30 teams um, entered, and hopefully, you know, you never know, we might see New Zealand represented in Las Vegas in the in the next big round. Um, but I think, you know, these things all help us to um, inspire but also lift capability and create that support network and the advisory that was needed. The other part of it, which is really big, is data governance. While we had policy and framework, we didn't have the end-to-end -end consolidated view for how do you get your data right. So I've introduced um, a stream alongside our data governance policy people into data quality specialists, metadata lineage experts, and also remediation fix-it people. Um, so that group works horizontally um, alongside the business so you can understand how to manage your data well, um, you identify the issues, you can understand your life cycle and your lineage for data, but also when you identify an issue, you've got a team there ready and able to help fix it. Um, that's made a huge difference um, in a lot of ways um, where we've been able to fast track um, really important defects that we've discovered through the process of lineage management. The other thing we did in terms of governance is I've put a full-time data steward into every business domain. So thinking domains like HR, finance, marketing, you name it, each, each key domain um, has their own steward. They, they report through centrally so that we have a community established and that group swarms together across the domains. So while they have a named domain that they're responsible for, they actually work together in unity. That means that we don't have key person risk, but also we're getting the benefit of different industry perspectives because they all have different capabilities that they're bringing together. We also have a consistent method um, and we're able to actually swarm on the most critical domains as well. So those are just some ideas. Um, Craft Leads was the other one that I should probably call out because whilst we had analysts in, um, embedded in the business, we needed Craft Leads to actually think about how do we nurture and develop them? When we're doing our demand capacity um, uh, analysis and we're seeing um, what type of capability is needed, how do we then train our people rather than just hire a new? So those craft leads are there and we've overlaid our contribution model on the demand capacity model, the workflow model, so that we can actually see where the gaps are and we can then look at um, who's moving where in their career development, what the pathways are, um, and joining those pathways up with, um, with other disciplines like engineering, for example, where modelers may want to move that direction or engineers may want to move to the front of business. Um, so having a look at those pathways is really important. It's giving our team an understanding of where they are on craft mastery, um, but putting the support around them to actually grow and develop. Because often, you know, people don't leave a business because they don't like that business or the other job is better. They often leave it because they're not being developed well or they don't see a way through. And so I think that's uh, really important as well. Yeah, Tony, there's so many best practices within change management that you've articulated here. I mean, overwhelmingly, I feel like you've created the why data matters, why data matters to Westpac, why does it matter to my business function, why does it matter to me? I often call it the WIFM, what's in it for me, right, to learn this, and you've given not only the framework, but the connection to the business value, but the framework to learn and to upskill and to be connected as part of a community and not just a project. All very important parts of change management to make it sticky and real and to build on that enthusiasm and inspiration that you're looking for in the organization. It just, it's, um, it's refreshing to hear the completeness of your change management mm -hmm. program, um, critically important. In fact, in this process, you've also developed your top 10 list, um, you know, in terms of, you know, um, helping to close the gaps. So let's start with what are the keys to closing these gaps? Yeah, and actually, it's a really good point you made about the change side in the, the community. Um, I think, you know, one of the first things I did was stand up a all welcome um, come along, ask any questions, um, community forum. And that runs every fortnight for anybody who wants to come. 
Um, and, and that is, a, you know, what we're doing is we're sort of pulling the pulling the curtains back and saying, come come in. This is, you know, the word data can sometimes uh, frighten people, or it seems like it's a dark spot. Yeah. And we need to um, allow people to engage and understand it. And through those uh, communities, I generally bring um, somebody to tell a story about what they're doing. And so that storytelling is really important too. Um, and that storyteller may be someone from the business, it may be someone from the tech side, it may be an external um, conversation, just sharing. And um, I think you know that helps to normalise the conversation as well. Um, aside, you know, the, I, I think some of the um, the first ones I started, I had you know 40, then 90, now a couple of hundred, now 400 attend. Um, and you know, so it's starting to give them momentum, which is also a really good indicator. Um, you know, I think before I get into that top 10, just one of the key things that we do need to think about is um, how does our tech um, support what we're doing? Yeah. Um, and so we have been working quite closely uh, with our um, security, our cyber, our um, architect team. In fact, actually, I have um, members the, of um, those groups on my what I call my virtual lead team. Um, so anyone who's involved in that end-to-end -end, um, delivery needs to be on my lead team. And so it doesn't matter where the reporting lines are, they come together regardless. Because we have a vested interest in common and we need to work together on solving. And sometimes, you know, solutions architecture in particular and engineering don't necessarily get the opportunity to really see what the business is trying to do or engage um, where the data is really um, most important. So um, we have, um, you know, that steel thread, I've actually used that to also stand up our cloud proof of concept. So everything aligns into that business outcome using the most important use case. Um, and so working really, really closely um, to co-design the solution so that um, success looks like, not just in the hands of the analysts in a good way, but um, bringing machine learning through at pace as well. So within that, we've created a, uh, a partnership uh, with AWS, and we also work with Azure, but um, in this case, the, the conversation is around, how did we lift and shift some IP from an external partner? Um, so AWS, really good at um, working at scale um, to deliver value to customers, working fast. So I sort of rang them up and said, do you know what, we want your IP, we want the, the mechanic. And they said, actually, it's funny, that's what we call it, the mechanic. I said, great, if we pull together some human-centered design, some data science, some data engineering, software engineering people into um, a go fast start, um, delivery mode, this DevSec ops together with design, would you come in alongside us and hand over your mechanic? And they said, yes, so we're actually doing that right now. Um, and I think what that's doing is it's really helping us to fast track um, that tech to business delivery component. And by bringing those groups together who normally work in a silo, that's really changing the way that we work as well. So um, I think, you know, that's that's kind of a, a little bit of a, um, a look in. There's a lot more to it and, and very happy to pick up any conversations um, that people might have. I know that there's no question opportunity here, but there may be some some that come through <laughs> and happy to pick them up after before we run into the, the summary of my top 10 takeaways. <laughs> yeah, Sonia, um, you know, it's a great point about your relationships, you know, having those strong relationships, you know, within your organization, outside of your organizations, bringing in your solution architects, you know, all parts to connecting to, again, you know, give that time to value to the businesses. Um, if maybe you can share a little bit more with um, the audience here on what that operating model and organization structure look like, you know, how, how did you design it um, and what, what's been important for you? Yeah, so designing it was really thinking about um, what are we trying to achieve here and then who needs to come together. So I think we, sometimes we get tripped up with uh, what is my sphere of control rather than what, what role do I play in contributing to an outcome. And that's kind of fundamentally how we then work out how do people come together. So thinking less about um, groups of people who are run in linear fashion to more fluid uh, movement of capability, um, joining it up with a focus. And that allows that certainty and confidence 
but also brings, you know, the biggest thing for me is getting the right conversation happening in the room with the right people. Um, otherwise you can wheel spin or you're missing a piece. And so I think that, you know, that way of working is key and um, lots of lots of attempts at it. Uh, I think we can get tripped up with too many ceremonies and lots of, you know, um, the, the template rather than the content. And if we think more about, you know, what, what content are we going after? Therefore, let that drive, let that outcome drive what the inputs are. Um, instead of, I've got a team, how do I use them? Right. And that then frees up also, yeah. Yeah, really I like important. that that focus on the outcome uh, is, is critically important than having the organization designed around it. You know, another mm -hmm. thing is, um, you know, to enable these teams, you know, we've got, you know, an, we've already got an overview of your organization and an operating model um, and the breadth of, you know, technical and business skills and being able to leverage all of that, how does technology enable your team to execute on this strategy? How, how has that helped and, and what are some of the plans there? Yeah, so I think it's fundamentally a combination of um, business, people and technology. Those three things are the, are the magic ingredients to get right. And often, uh, you know, we'll see a business problem tossed over the fence to technology when actually it's a human problem. It may be a business process that needs improvement, uh, not necessarily a tech thing. Or in the case of um, when you look at uh, process improvement, we have too many steps generally. You know, when you think about a business that's heavily regulated, you often have multiple steps on top of multiple steps, and that just makes it really hard for staff and really hard for customers. And so if you can use technology to simplify, uh, reduce duplication of effort, um, and uh, limit the number of steps, then that's a great use of technology. But often tech just gets handed the whole problem. Um, and, and often what I observe is that it is the combination of how we how we behave, um, how we're supported to behave in terms of our processes, but also then the technology attached to those things, um, which is why the design component is so, so important. When we think about um, human-centered design, often it's focused on the features or designing a new product. Um, where I think it really hits its straps is in how do you think about that process improvement from a UX, CX point of view, whether it be staff or customers, and then have the data and tech team involved in that conversation so that we can really bring that magic together. Then tech knows which piece they can solve for. Then business and um, our change management know which piece they can solve for. Um, if, you, if you do it in silos, then everyone tries to solve the whole problem by themselves. And, um, and often what you find is, oh no, I've got a gap, or with best intent, we might make a camel out of it because we pass it over the fence to the next person who tries to solve the whole thing. When the reality is you come together in the first place and um, each runs in their sweet spot. Exactly. Definitely. And, and I've got to call out too, I think that one of the um, big areas where technology can help is also in our data lineage. Um, and, you know, a little shout out to Informatica because you are our partner in this space. But really, you know, when I talked about the complexity of our critical data elements, you really need to have automated lineage tools to be able to get there. And um, so there are some things that you don't want to design and build yourself uh, that make sense. Um, and where you've got partners who've invested and bring that expertise, then, you know, bring that ecosystem into play as well. because. If your partner understands what you're going after and understands the key pain points, um, there's a lot more to it generally uh, that they can bring in terms of their experience and expertise, not just the technology itself. Right, excellent points, excellent points. Well, um, so any, anytime I have an experience, uh, Chief Data Officer, I always like to ask them, and in fact, uh, end on this note is asking them to share their top lessons learned. So those top 10 lessons and key takeaways that you have found most valuable in your journey. So take it away. <laughs> Alrighty, I'll start at the top. Um, and actually it's number one, it starts at the top. So our executive, um, making it easy for them to role model and engage. You know, really, it's not just about does the, does the executive support you, it's about what are you doing to support the executive to understand and get engaged. You can't, it can't be a one-way street. So start at the top, 
help them understand and make sure that they really do get the effort to value conversation um, that you're bringing. Secondly, it's about people. First and foremost, always. Even if you're using technology to support people, it's about people that you're supporting, your customers, your staff, the way that you're actually running your business with your stakeholders and shareholders. Um, so value really values really matter. Um, building those relationships and earning trust is a big, big part of day one, day two, and day every day. Um, data culture, you know, at the end of the day, data culture is a summation of the activities of a group of people. And so you need to make sure that the, you know, the behaviours come together, that there's diversity of backgrounds um, matters. And, you know, the, the bringing those different perspectives together is where the magic happens. Um, but, but we're also looking for common traits in our people and the people that we bring on board, we hire via values. Um, but we also, in particular within that, we're looking for passion, we're looking for attitude and positivity. Um, we know that um, when you bring in one person who doesn't uh, approach it the same way, it can create a problem for everybody. Um, so we need to make sure, you know, the quality of your work makes, does make a difference. Um, and you can spiral up or down based on the dynamic um, that you create there. So um, in, in providing that environment, but bringing that combination together and giving them their voice is really, really important. Um, I'd say number three, go for brilliant basics. Um, bad data is no good for anyone. Um, and neither is fragmented or incomplete data. Um, and we all know that. But if you can't access it in the right way or if you can't explain it, um, then you know that value is effectively trapped or it won't be believed, um, especially if you get two people coming at it from a different direction and two different numbers sitting at the board table. That's not a good outcome. Um, so invest in the right foundation for better access and faster delivery. Um, know your data well. Um, make sure you have the right governance and controls around it um, so people can access it safely. Um, I think there's not enough done on resolved data quality issues. Like you can identify it, but get on with it and solve it. You know, um, these things are not going to go away and constantly uh, focus on improving it. So we can't wait till all data is beautiful, but what we can do is keep moving on it, right? And get it better every time. Um, and look for common synergies um, and repeatable patterns so that you're reducing that duplicated effort. Um, I think as we move forward into more competitive situations, you really can't to do, um, take an ad hoc approach or a singular approach to how you're managing data. We see it, you know, when we're looking at the business outcomes we're going after, you can see that one enabler of data can actually unlock multiple lanes of value. So thinking more holistically around how we actually manage our data um, is really important. Um, fourth one. Um, connect to the big picture in a commercial way. I keep banging on about this, but tangible results really matter. Um, and so be really outcome oriented. Uh, really, really understand and spend time defining the problem uh, and be able to demonstrate de specifically how data is delivering to the business by showing that value and that effort to value and linking to those performance outcomes. Um, and the fifth one, Put your capability where it matters most. So um, thinking end to end and think bigger. Um, you know, that outcome-based approach with the capability in a flow-to-work manner, um, I'm pretty committed to that lane of thinking. Um, and I know, uh, you know, it works for me. It's worked in my testing. And I guess you can test and learn this too. You know, you don't have to go whole hog. Um, but look for opportunities too where um, machine learning can have the most impact. Um, and how we can actually work alongside our, um, our analysts and our people in the business to think about, um, you know, how often do you do this? Should we um, be looking at how we automate? Is it something static or should it be something fluid? It's not one size fits all. We need to really think about the purpose for which the data is moving or needs to move and how often. Um, so that capability aligned to those things is really important because it does change who comes into the room. Um, collaborate and co-design to get skin in the game, number six. Um, this is really about onboarding um, that belief and trust and people, you know, you earn trust through connection and normalising conversations and showing up and doing what you say you will do. Um, and with that comes the courage to really focus um, and collectively to stop things. So. Um, by having the right relationships, you can have those open conversations and say, look, we've run with this um, sprint and it's not looking good. Um, we don't think there's value in pursuing it. 
um, to have the ability to have those conversations based on, you need to have the relationship first, um, but you know, you really do need to collaborate to get there um, so that everyone's um, seeing it and understanding it. Um, number, the next one, I've lost my count, seven, measure it. <laughs> Gravitas comes through benchmarking, uh, seeing the gaps and being able to measure and talk about that progress that you're making. Um, so have clear goals to deliver against and hard KPIs. I have some pretty specific KPIs on how I'm going to close my gaps. Um, next is become a storyteller. Um, and you have to make data relatable and take the conversation from data driven to data excited. Um, this was a term that actually came from one of our board members. Um, she got so excited she said, oh my gosh, we're no longer data driven, we're data excited. And isn't that a great way to see that buy-in and that connection uh, from the executive down? Um, you know, uh, that's, that's super important. Um, where are we up to? We have to uh, be transparent, number nine. Make our work visible. Um, our wins and our failures, and most importantly, our progress. Because as long as we have momentum, we're, in the, we're, we're on the right track, right? And it might feel like it's going slow, but you're heading in a direction and everyone can rally behind that and you'll see that that momentum starts to snowball over time. And number 10 is related, um, small steps to greatness. Um, you know, thinking agile and demonstrating through doing it every opportunity, these small steps add up. And over time, we find that we'll, we'll be running before we know it. Mm -hmm. Well, Sonia, I, I actually want to print all of these and post them on a wall and share them with all of my, um, my chief data officers that I work with on a regular basis. Because this is, it's so true. You've, you've connected um, the tangible things that in, in, from a business perspective, the business outcomes, you know, to making it real to the skills, to the people. You've addressed also the human elements of change, you know, getting them excited, getting them inspired, um, teaching them the skills around data. Um, and you've also laid in a, a strong foundation uh, that will carry from, from current state maturity onwards. So it's, um, and, and you're giving metrics, you're giving metrics, you're giving a sense for where we are, what are the levers to, to pull and how to get there. So really just impressive leadership in terms of navigating through the change. So um, I know that this is called the zero to hero session. You know, honestly, you were never a zero. You were always a hero and you've just applied it now to make more heroes out of Westpac New Zealand. So um, I've thoroughly enjoyed today's session and I wanna thank you so much uh, for sharing it with others. Um, I think your LinkedIn might just blow up by the amount of connections you're going to have as a result of this. So I want to thank you again uh, for sharing. And we look forward to hearing even more of your journey and hearing um, more along the journey in terms of where your um, statuses are. So thanks again, Sonia. Uh, back over to you for any closing comments or um, thanking the audience. Oh, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I hope, you know, there is value and um, I know, you know, we're all on a journey. This is, you know, you don't, you don't go into these roles as Chief Data Officer um, thinking it's going to be um, a simple ride. <laughs> this is a very uncomfortable space, but that's what's exciting about it. Um, and I think, you know, um, my congratulations to everyone out there who is taking this role on, um, you know, and um, as a community, I think we can really help each other, which is, um, why it's such a such a great opportunity to share my story. Looking forward to hearing everyone else's as well across the symposium. Thank you so much, Sonia. Uh, thank you again. I thank you for being a fantastic partner.